verses 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate lay a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If you do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. When you go home today, on your answering machine or voicemail, you may have a message. It's going to go something like this. Congratulations! You have won an all-expense pay trip for two nights and three days to Atlantic City, New York, Miami, Orlando, Las Vegas, you name it. All you need to do is call us back at 1-800-FREE-TRIP to hear more about this special trip that's planned especially for you. Have got those calls? And what do you, what's, what's the pitch? Well, you got to go and listen for about two, maybe three hours to some salesperson who's going to try to sell you a timeshare or some other vacation club plan that you just can't live without. You're going to win a free trip this morning. <clears throat> All you got to do is listen to me for the next few minutes, and at the end, I guarantee that you will have a free trip made especially for you, and you get to pick the destination of one of two places. Pretty good. Who knew? Tell your friends. Here's your choice. You can go to heaven. You can go to hell. Oh, the pastor said hell in his sermon. We don't talk about hell. You know what? You're right, we don't. If you go through the Gospels, what you take and you hear is Jesus spends a lot of time talking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is life. And he goes on to tell a story. The scripture this morning is one of the few passages that you'll find that really kind of, to some extent, opens the door to the possibility of what hell might be like. What's your image of hell? If I said to you to come up with a couple of words to describe hell, what would you come up with? One guy that I, I really enjoy because he's got this warped sense of humor is Gary Larson. Gary Larson was the Far Side cartoons. He has some ideas of hell, and I know these are a little hard. This is bowler's hell. Every time you bowl, you get a 710 split, and if you notice that the, the alley's really wide and it says that Satan's keeping score, and he goes, Whoa, another split. What a bummer. 
other ideas that he has. These are nerds in hell. You know, the guy that stands in line and goes, wow, hot enough for you? <laughs> yeah. We have another. <clears throat> Come on, it's one room or the other. One door says, damn if you do, and the other door says, damn if you don't. <laughs> this is one for my wife. It's a conductor, maestro, walking in and goes, and here is your room, right here, and it's filled with banjo players. <laughs> and I like this one because it gives us our concept of what heaven is like and what is hell is like. Oh, got to go back. I don't know if we can. The top image was, in, okay, man goes into heaven and, and, and God's handing him a harp. Here's your harp. And in the bottom, here's your accordion. <laughs> Sorry for those accordion players. Larson has a very interesting concept of hell. But we have another image of hell because we take and we look at what Charles Dickens and Again, a picture of Scrooge in hell. Now, you remember that for Scrooge, he always liked things really cold, right? And he wouldn't want to put the extra coal. So Scrooge, Scrooge's hell is freezing cold all the time. And you can see him wrapped in those chains, those chains that he made link by link um, throughout his life. So we have images of hell that people have put out there for us. Um, it was a, during my interviews um, for um, ordination, I got asked, asked about my, my job and my experience and that sort of thing. And in the midst of my answer, I happened to say that my last few weeks of my, my job um, before entering seminary, um, it was just like a living hell. Well, one of the people of this committee quickly picked up on the fact that, you know, I used that phrase and started to challenge me on it. He says, so hell can be here on earth? And I said, well, there are moments when our lives can be hell-like. And he kept pushing and kept asking questions. And he wanted me to go further. And I, I kind of said, well, to me, hell is like torment and agony, of which there is no relief. It just is there all the time. And that's the way my job was. That as soon as I walked in the door, there was this constant torment, this constant anguish. And I said, at times, it almost was like there was no presence of God. Well, that didn't sit well, you can imagine. He says, so God isn't present everywhere at all the time? And I said, well, it, it was like when I walked in the door, there was no compassion, there was no grace, there was no understanding, there was no forgiveness. It was almost as if God just wasn't present. Well, afterwards, the, the gentleman who was a pastor came up to me, and I kind of looked at him, and I went, wow. Because the whole time I'm just, was really like, what am I doing? I'm digging myself in. And he said two things. One, he, had, he pushed because he wanted to see if I would back off and I'd become wishy-washy and waver in my response because I was getting pushed. The other one was he said that he wanted to push on the concept of hell. That most people, that's not something that we think about. We have images of heaven we don't have a really good image of hell. But we have one in the scripture, don't we? This rich man who has had everything in his life now finds himself in this place. And those same words are there. Torment, constant torment. He's in agony. He's begging Abraham to take and send Lazarus. By the way, it's not Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus. It is not the Lazarus that got raised from the dead. It's just a fellow named Lazarus. He's begging to send Lazarus down. Just dip his finger in, the, in water to take and place it upon my lips to take and, and lift me from this agony, this anguish that I'm in. Imagine being in that place. And there's something further. Did you catch the part about the chasm? That idea that, can you imagine how it would be to be in a place of torment and anguish, 
a place that seems to be absent from the presence of God, and yet you can see across to see people who are blessed, who are, who are in the midst of joy, and these people are there, and you can't get there, and they can't get to you. It also says to me that there's a sense of permanence that, you know, it's not a case of people are jumping back and forth between heaven and between hell. It's almost like once you're there, you're there, folks. It should take and begin to, to some extent, churn within us. It should begin to ask a real question, I would hope. Which destination are we headed for? Which place is our eternal resting spot. Again, it's not something we, we tend to think about. Most of the time what we do is want to take and, and push people towards that idea of heaven. That's the prize. That's the thing we're all reaching for. And if we're all good boys and girls and we say our prayers, we all go to heaven and we have a big smile on our face. But we need to understand that if Heaven comes as a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ. It comes as a result of our faith and our trust in God. It has something to do with that idea of confession and repenting to understand that we are not perfect human beings. But Jesus came into the world not to condemn us, but to save us. And it's that theme that we need to take and have close to our own hearts. That we are not condemned. And yet each and every one of us can be saved by simply acknowledging <coughs> Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Coming and confessing that we are not the people we want to be, but God wants us to be. But there's a second part of the story too. Did you hear the anguish that the rich man had? Because his me this message of, of, of lifelong eternal torment was probably maybe there for his brothers too. And he wanted to take and save them from his fate. He said, please, send Lazarus to them. Send a message to them so that they understand that this does not have to be their fate too. But as Abraham explains, well, you know, it's there for them. It's there in, in, in the scriptures with Moses. It's there with the prophets. It's there in all for us to hear and to be warned about. And there's something to be said that if we took and had, were exposed to hell just for five minutes, would we not come back and do everything in our power to save our family, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers from that eternal torment and agony? Would you not take and, and push to the best that you could so that others would not have to experience that for themselves? You see, there's one thing, direction we can always go in. We can always go in and everything is fine and put happy smiles on our faces and think in a positive way that everything will be just fine. Put your trust in God, put your trust in Jesus, and everything will be fine. But if we're not doing what we can to take and build that relationship with God and Jesus for ourselves, and if we're not taking and sharing both sides of the coin, then I'm not sure we're doing all that God expects of us to do. The faith of our family and friends, our own, is there for each of us to consider. We can leave this place this morning and go, that's okay, I go to church on Sunday morning, I don't have to worry about hell, I don't have to worry about that. Well, you know what? That's really good news. It really is good news. But can you say that about others that are in your life? We have an opportunity not only to make a difference 
for all eternity for us, but to take and have a responsibility to help those around us. I think, to some extent, that's what the Walk to Emmaus is about, to help us grow deeper in our faith, to help us have an understanding of our relationship with God and with Jesus Christ, and to come back and share the difference that's in our lives with those around us. It's scary sometimes to share our faith. It should sometimes, it's difficult to get real with people, especially those who want to push aside our faith, or push aside our God, push aside our Savior, Jesus Christ. God has placed those people in our lives in what we do, in what we said, to make an eternal difference in their lives. It says a lot about who we are. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know if you have that incredible confidence that you have an eternal resting place in the kingdom of heaven. I don't know if you're worried about whether you're getting a heartburn or an accordion. But what I do know is that when we become real with God and real with Jesus Christ and come to understand that it's in that special moment when we acknowledge the fact that we're all sinners and that our, the saving grace rests with God and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And when we make that acknowledgement, we begin to take and journey close into that relationship that will be an everlasting relationship with Christ in his heavenly kingdom. As we come to this time, as we wrap up with a side time of prayer, I invite you to pray with me, maybe if it's for the first time, to come and acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And acknowledge your own sin before God and before Christ. And come to understand that as we make that acknowledgement, we come into the blessed saving grace of Jesus Christ. We will have our place in heaven. So let's come now before God and before Christ. But God, I don't know where each and every one of us are this morning in, in our journey in faith. Maybe we've taken and held off acknowledging the saving grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. But we have other times and we're still unsure of, of that love that you poured out. But help us to come and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is your Son, Son of God, our Lord and our Savior. And help us, oh God, in this very moment to acknowledge that we are sinners. And there's nothing we can do short of acknowledging the saving grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, to take and work our way into your heavenly kingdom. And so we pray that prayer, that Jesus Christ, Son of God, come and save me, a sinner. And yet, oh God, we know that saving grace is there for us. That we can escape the chains of eternal torment and agony and enter into the heavenly bliss and joy of worshiping you throughout all eternity. That we can take and know that there is a table set at your heavenly banquet of which we can come that we will know blessings beyond our wildest imagination. And it begins with our understanding that your Son came into this world not to condemn, but to save each and every one of us from our sin. And that in his name we will not perish, but have eternal life. There is part of your heavenly kingdom. And for that, O oh God, in your Son, Jesus Christ's holy name, we take and pray say thank you. Amen. I'd like you to stand at your able and let us join together and